Cool, I think we're starting now. Um, great, well, hello everyone. Welcome to our May council <clears throat> meeting. Uh, my name is Paula Aguilera. I'm the co-chair of the uh, Neighborhood Council for Glendale. Um, and uh, Turner's on the call. He's he just got back from travel, so I'll be I'll be leading this one uh, here today. Um, we have a couple things on the agenda for today. Uh, we're starting with some community updates. One of my community updates is going to be an actual presentation, um, and it's it's part of the agenda. So I'll just go ahead go ahead and skip that and save that for for later. Um, and I'll open it up to any other uh, community members. Uh, I would ask that you raise your hand if you have any community updates at this time. And if not, uh, I see Michaela's on the call and uh, she is first on our agenda. So I'll just wait to see if anyone has anything else to add. And if not, I think Michaela, we, you have to go ahead. And I'm not seeing anything coming through the chat. Uh, so Michaela, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Michaela. I am the brand new public lands planner with Salt Lake City Public Lands. I've been on for about two months now and I've heard really great things about this community council. So I'm really excited to be here. Um, and I also see we have on the line Stephanie from our engineering department as well as Jack from Tree Utah. And we're gonna be here talking to you guys a little bit about the, our upcoming Nine Line Orchard project. So I'm not sure if and when was the last time this community council heard about the project. So I'm just gonna start off with a little bit of orientation and then I'll hand it over to Jack to talk a little bit more about uh, the nitty gritty. So, oh, I am disabled for screen sharing. Is, there, is it possible for me to get that permission? That's fixed, go ahead. Beautiful, thank you. So if that looks okay to everyone, just to orient us here, we have the Jordan River Trail uh, on the west, sorry, the east side of the Jordan River. We have the Fife Wetlands and Parkview Elementary. And the site that we're gonna be talking about is gonna be right here between Emory and 11th West, um, bounded on the south side by Hayes Avenue. And this is that exact same shape that we just saw here. So these are conceptual drawings from the Nine Line Orchard. Um, these are in draft form, but we're moving forward with this kind of idea of what the project will be looking at. Here's the east side and the west side. Right here, this east side is gonna be phase one of the project, and this is going to be anticipated to be completed by the fall of, 20, of, of this year. And I, I, sorry, I just sent this over to uh, Turner as well um, to be shared with this group. So I'm a little bit sorry that that was on me to, I didn't send that over earlier. And so I'm hoping that this can be circulated as well. And this, you can just see a little bit of more details about what exactly each of these trees will be. It is an orchard. So a lot of, I believe almost all of these will be some sort of fruit producing plant. And we're really excited to have Tree Utah on who's really excited about this project. and. We'll be doing a lot of maintenance and programming at this site, which I think is a really great time to hand it over to Jack to talk a little bit more about what Tree Utah is hoping to do there. Would you, oh, Jack, you're muted, uh, but would you like me to continue sharing this? Um, yeah, sure, that'd be great. I think it'd be great to have the maps up while we talk over it. Um, and thank you, like, like they said, I'm Jack, I'm Tree Utah's education coordinator. Uh, I'm here filling in for Amy, our executive director, um, who has really been the one spearheading this whole project for us. And she is also a member of the Glendale community uh, as well. Many of you probably already know her. Uh, I'm super happy to be here. Um, before I dive into the project itself, maybe I'll give a little background on Tree Utah for anyone who isn't totally familiar. Um, our mission is to improve the quality of Utah's environments uh, for present and future generations through tree planting, education, and stewardship. We're a statewide nonprofit, but we are based out of Salt Lake. We're actually located right near this area. Our office is at 4th West and 9th South in Art Space Commons. Um, and we basically achieve our mission through three main planting programs, our community planting program in which we plant trees with community members and volunteers at public parks throughout the states, um, making it a sort of community engagement get together, um, day of service to plant some trees in green spaces. Um, that we all share. 
Um, we also do school plantings. Um, we plant trees at schools. We plant with a lot of schools in the Glen Glendale neighborhood and the neighboring areas. Uh, we've planted with Parkview Elementary, which is right next to where this orchard is gonna be multiple times. Um, and we plant with students and just try to make trees as educational um, as possible for young people garnering a new generation of folks who are environmentally conscious and love trees just like us. Um, and then the third main program that we have is our restoration program um, through which we do restoration work in native habitats um, and ecological restoration sites throughout the state. A lot of stuff along the Jordan River Trail. Um, we've done lots of uh, restoration work um, in the Fife wetlands right next to where this orchard is going to be. Um, doing? Other places throughout Utah. So those are our three main programs. Um, but another thing that we are interested in moving oh, making more cheesecake. that we've done a little bit in the past yeah. is um, community orchards and all the good things. Sorry, Jack, go ahead. I, I got no that background noise. All good. Um, so this project, this orchard project is actually um, sort of based off of another community orchard that we have nearby located in Rose Park right next to the Day Riverside Library. Um, we call it our eco garden. It's a permaculture orchard with all sorts of different fruit trees as well as edible understory plants um, that we use for all sorts of um, different reasons. We use it for educational activities. We use it as a community gathering space for community events. Um, we use it for volunteerism, but most importantly, we use it as a community food resource. Um, most of the stuff there that's growing is edible, um, and we allow anyone to come out and harvest whatever food they want, um, take it home with them if they have a need for healthy food um, and don't have the resources to get it super easily. Um, so those are kind of what we use that space for and our goals for this space are really the same. We want it to be a space for volunteerism for community members to come out um, and engage with other members of their community by doing service, um, helping to green spaces, keep natural spaces um, natural and well kept, um, and also as a community food res resource, like I said, um, in areas where healthy foods might not be super accessible all the time. Um, or available financially, um, we want to provide as much of a food resource as we can um, to folks um, through this community orchard project. So as was said, we're kind of gonna be breaking ground on it this fall um, and moving it to next spring as well. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions that anyone may have about Tree Utah or about it in general. I'll do my best to answer them, but I'm not really the one who has been the lead on this project for us, like I said. So if there's anything that I can't answer, I can connect you with Amy, our director, and she would happily answer any questions that you may have, so. Thank you so much for that, Jack. I think one thing I will add just to clarify is as far as this phase one goes, Public Lands is hoping to do a lot of, I think, the kind of the background infrastructure work through the late summer. And then we're hoping that sometime, I think in the fall, we'll be able to work with Tree Utah to actually have a volunteer event where we will go in and plant all of these plants. So that'll be a really great, hopefully community volunteering event where we'll put in the trees that you see here. Yep, thank you. Thanks for the clarification. <laughs> Hey Jack, I, I have one question. Is there a, is there a project website or uh, or what's the best way to follow along um, to keep keep up with the progress of, um, of this project? Sure. Yeah. I mean, as we go, I think we'll probably start putting out more as we get closer to um, what we are going to be doing after they get the the site prepared for us to plant in the fall. Um, I think the city, you guys have a, a flyer or a one page that you put together to hand out with information for folks or you're planning on putting together at some point. Yeah, um, we're working on it right now. Our communication team is kind of in flux, but we actually have a website that we're hoping to launch very, very soon. Um, and that website will have a web page for each of these projects. But anytime if you guys are looking for an update, feel free to reach out to me and we're happy to either come back or send an update. Great. Well, thank you. Um, does anyone else have any questions pertaining to this? I, I'm hey, curious. Hi. I'm just curious. I, maybe I missed this. I wasn't, maybe I, you talk, touched upon this, but so it's not like a community garden where people, I mean, it's going to be open to passers by, I mean, people who are passing by and they can just take what they want. Um, yes, to an extent, it's not going to be closed off like a community garden. It'll be more like almost a park resource. 
Um, and then as you get closer, obviously most of the food that is available is all kind of ready towards the end of the summer, the fall. That's when at our other community garden resource or permaculture orchard, we hold more volunteer events for folks to come out and gather food in an organized structured way to, to take it home with them. And whatever we harvest that we have at the end, we do donate to food pantries um, or other organizations that can get the food folks in need as well, so. Okay, I, I just know that at some community gardens, you know, there's been issues where the, the, the food ripens, it's starting to ripe, ripen and someone will come and take it all. So how have you thought about that and how are you going to, you know, just kind of be mindful or be? Um, yeah, that's an issue for that. Totally yeah. under, understood. That's an issue that is unfortunately kind of hard to, to mitigate. Um, I think a large part of that is just getting ahead of the ball game and making sure you don't give people a chance to do that. I know a lot of community resources like that don't get tended to as much as they should. And a lot of the fruit, if it doesn't get taken, ends up falling to the ground and, and rotting. So a big part of it is just on our end, making sure that we are keeping up with all of that work to make sure it runs as smoothly as possible. So. Great, any other have, questions for? Sorry, I didn't raise my hand, Paulo. But Go I ahead, Levi. Real quick, as far as the upkeep throughout the years, as you put it in place, is that gonna be solely on the residents to maintain? Because I know I've had a garden here in my house and it takes a lot of upkeep in addition to just harvesting. Uh, yep, and Tree Utah will be involved in the upkeep as well as public lands, I believe. Um, so it won't be up to the community members to do the upkeep um, overall, so. Oh, thank you. Yep. Great, any other questions for Jack or Michaela? Uh, this is Stephanie with engineering. So I think just some of their timelines were off that they were talking about, because we're just in, well, about to have 70% review soon. So with design reviews and stuff, I like the soonest we would probably have a contractor is September and we'll probably be behind that schedule. So say September through December construction. Um, so that's likely to take us, um, I think like Jack said, into the next year. And then for plantings, I think even time for getting uh, volunteers and funding and education. I think even the tree plantings will be longer than what they were mentioning. I don't know if that's right, Michaela and Jack, but that's been my understanding. Thanks for the clarification there, Stephanie. Yeah, totally appreciate that. <laughs> and timelines, I think you saw a note on the drawing. It depends on the budget, what we can get done, but same thing, schedules are depending on unknowns and some things like that. Yeah, yeah, I think the goal is to to do the first planting this fall, but that is just a goal. Um, and it may and not. with um, COVID um, and contractors and pricing, we might also advertise with some flexibility if because right now the contractors, by the time we advertise, they already have all their projects for this year. And so if it's more flexible and it's easier for them to and then at the end of the year, they're trying to finish up those projects. So depending on their flexibility too, we might let, see if they if it, we get better prices or even get more bids if they can start next year. So that might vary by the time we bid. Totally. Yep. Thank you. Appreciate that. Yeah. Thank you for that. Okay. Well, thank you both uh, for presenting. If you wouldn't mind leaving uh, some contact information uh, to kind of have it cataloged in the chat. Sure. I'll, and, leave, uh, I'll leave my contact and Amy, our director's contact information for folks. Um, she can probably answer your questions a lot better than I can if you can, if you have them. So you're probably better off emailing her. Um, I also apologize. I'm going to have to step out after this. Um, I was just here for the presentation, but I'm excited to be here and excited to move forward with this project. Hill. So thanks. Yeah. Thanks, appreciate Jack. your time. Uh, next on the agenda, we have the Fife Wetland proposal. Uh, I don't know if Dan Potts is on the call. Um, and if not, I don't think I see him. Um, we can move on to the next agenda item, which is uh, Fawn Groves with US, USU's Aspire Center. Uh, so Fawn, um, if you're on, now's your time. Okay, let's see. Can you hear me and or see me? Both, yes. Good, I don't see myself, which is never a complaint for me. So as long as you can see me and I'm not 
you know, I'm not looking at the top of my hair or something. I discovered at the end of the meeting of a meeting that that was the case. And I thought all those people and nobody told me that all they could see was my hair. You're coming um, in. Good. I'm so glad. Um, I am Fawn Groves. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen anyway. Do I have permissions to do that? Let me see. You should. Oh, there I am. Let me center myself a little better. Yep, there it is. Let me share this. Okay. Um, so assuming that looks okay, um, I will let it kind of guide what I'm talking about. Um, Fawn Groves from the Aspire NSF Engineering Research Center, and you can see there below, Aspire stands for a lot of big words. But in a nutshell, we are an engineering center that is nationwide. We're based at Utah State, and we're focusing on electric vehicles and the benefits that come of those. So um, I want to introduce just a little bit about who we are and kind of what we are doing on our end based on the grant we have received to do that. But because um, it has the potential to impact Salt Lake's west side, we want to do everything we can to make sure that that is a positive impact, that it's an impact that the West Side is interested in. Um, and we want to make sure that we are listening as much as we talk, if not more than we talk, so that we stay throughout the process um, connected with you and, and know what kinds of things we can do with our work that will be of benefit and will match your interests. So as I said, Utah State is Aspire's headquarters. Um, but we have we are all together nine campuses across the US and then we also have laboratory partners. So we have lots of engineering going on lots of computer science. I myself am not on the technical side of all that. Um, what I do is um, engage with communities and do this kind of thing build relationships and make sure that what we're doing is not just a lot of nuts and bolts but that we really have at the center of our work the people that we are serving. So um, that's where our vision comes from. Our vision through electric vehicle development is to really think about health equity, um, equity in transportation, equity in environment um, and access to clean environments. Um, and we want everything we do to be widespread and to be accessible. So clean air, low cost transportation, new jobs, all of those things are things that we want to come out of our work with electric vehicles. But even more than that, we want that those um, opportunities and benefits to go to the communities in which we'll be working. So what I love about Aspire, and I have only been with Aspire for two months, so I have learned fast and I'm learning a lot more as I go. Um, so if tonight you have questions that I don't have the answers to, I will take those to our team. That's my job is to really facilitate the flow of communication between the West Side and our team at Aspire. Um, we have what we call the READY program, Research, Engineering, Workforce Development, Diversity and Culture of Inclusion, and Innovation Ecosystems. Um, but aside, but without going into all of those details, what I love is this graphic because it really is the heart of the way we want to do things. No matter who is doing what on our team, and you saw how extensive our team is, um, we really do take seriously the infusion of all of the work we're doing with everyone else's work. And at the end of the day, making sure those pieces of um, representation and equity in our work are woven into the very fabric of what we do. I wouldn't have taken this position with Aspire if I didn't really have the sense that that's what Aspire is serious about doing. So at the end of the day, um, or as our director likes to say, where the rubber meets the road, is that we really are just looking for a better world. I am a Salt Lake native. Um, I grew up in Taylorsville. Um, I have family on the west side, and I'm well aware that we have environmental issues, we have health challenges, transportation, especially on the west side can be, I don't need to tell you what a challenge it can be, but I really, I knew it was a challenge, and then I needed to get to a meeting that was over there, and I was over here, but in between those two places <laughs> was lots of construction and 
freeway and rail and all of that. So um, what you see at the bottom here of my slide is kind of a representation. It's a rendering, but um, in a nutshell, our work is looking at not just electrifying vehicles. Um, in fact, we won't be manufacturing those vehicles. We will be working on what you see here, a system that will wirelessly charge vehicles while they're in motion. So we're looking at um, electrifying um, roads so that cars as they drive over them will be um, continuously charged. Um, buses that are electric and are not emitting pollutants. We're working with um, train companies, rail companies, uh, and everything in between. So as we have these discussions, we're interested in knowing what does the community want. Um, we can talk everything from, you know, um, electrified freight vehicles all the way down to electrified scooters. What, what serves the community? What do they need? Um, so with Salt Lake's West Side in particular, um, this is kind of an overview of what we hope to do. We want to address the challenges that community members have already told us and that we have been able to ascertain that are central um, concerns. And maybe top of mind is health, um, air quality and things like that, transportation, access to lucrative employment, education. And then by political governance, what we mean is letting the West Side make decisions for the West Side and really having the tools to um, take the work that we do and hold that up to other communities who hopefully at some future date will, will say, wow, the West Side really was facing some challenges. They came through it in amazing ways. We want to learn from them. So Aspire is interested in leaving something that uh, can be continued and, and handed to other communities who hopefully can look to the West Side for a model. Um, through that and that center, truly the center of everything we want to do will be collaborative. Uh, so we have already started working with some of your community leaders at the community level. Um, just yesterday, I met with Senator Luz Escamilla, a group of us did. Um, we would like to pursue leaders at all levels, community um, representatives, school districts, and do a lot of talking and listening. And then, as I said, co-develop a blueprint with the community for solving problems that the community identifies so that those can be used to support other communities. Um, these are some of the places that I and my partner, um, Dr. Amy Wilson Lopez, who is on our faculty in the School of Teacher Education and Leadership, we are working to compile a community advisory board. So um, we hope to talk with community coalitions, community leaders, chambers of commerce, faith-based organizations on the West Side um, to learn who, who can speak for the West Side, who do the residents want to speak for them and who can guide our work as we go through its different, different phases. Um, so I won't go into detail here because I've kind of summarized this already, but these really are the four and sort of a fifth area that we envision focusing on. Um, this is what we will propose, and then we will listen to hear where are the areas where the community is interested in having us go forward. Access to healthy environments, access to vehicles and transportation, access to not just employment opportunities, but also job training and preparation for those. Um, access to quality curriculum at the K through 12 level. And then we also would like to work with adult education and uh, technical ed. Um, and at the end of the day, giving communities accessible avenues for their own decision-making um, so that they have the power to go forward in the ways that they choose. So I took the liberty of calling our model the West Side model because we, we really do want to be kind of led in this process. In one way we're initiating it, but quickly once we get that community advisory board um, alongside us, we really hope to follow and let the West Side develop this model. So our plan going in is lots of listening, um, understanding who are the stakeholders, what experiences have they had, what concerns do they have, what wishes do they have going forward, and then collaboratively taking action to um, 
engage the community, to engage stakeholders um, in industry. For example, we have been speaking with uh, the UTA to find out some of the things they have done, what has worked, how did communities respond, um, and then designing something that can be sustainable so that as we do um, feel that our work with electric vehicles can sustain itself, that everything else that we have created along the way, or I should say have worked with communities to develop along the way, is something that can sustain itself uh, without us. So those are really my comments for today. Tonight I just wanted um, to introduce us, let you know who we are. I really hope to be as a part of as many community meetings as I can going forward. Um, so that I hope I haven't frozen. I think my screen just froze. Can I see some thumbs up that people can hear me? Okay, good. You, can hear um, you. you were frozen for a second. That's oh, okay. I, everything held still for a minute. So at any rate, I am finished, um, but my contact information is here and I really hope I will become a familiar face. Um, I plan to just be as present on the West side as possible. Obviously I'll have limitations being that I'm located here at Utah State. Uh, but please do consider me um, available. You are welcome to reach out to me. Um, and very soon, hopefully, I'll be taking some active part in finding out what concerns the West Side regarding the things I've talked about and how we can get started in doing some good things. So thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate it. Me. Thank you, Fawn. Um, well, I'm next on the agenda, but we want to make sure if there's any questions directed at Fun, uh, you wouldn't mind raising your hand and we can get that underway, or if you have anything in the chat. Um, we, do, we do have a question from Andrew Johnson in, in the chat, um, and the question is, could someone explain what exactly the Aspire project is? <laughs> I'll, 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 let you, I'll let you speak to that. Thank you. I love that question. And the only reason I laugh is because I had that exact question just two months ago. So um, maybe I will share. I spoke just earlier today to the National Science Foundation and had a little more of a technical presentation. Maybe if I can pull up a few of those slides that might help. Let's see, where did it go? Okay, if I can, let me, I might have to shuffle through these a little bit. Let me see if I can share a couple of slides that might shed some light on that. Okay, I assume I'm sharing. Some of this is gonna look familiar. So this goes into a little more detail, same slide, um, different audience this morning. Um, Aspire's mission, again, is really to improve health and quality of life for everyone by focusing on sustainable electrification across the transportation industry. So today, speaking with the Glendale community, I mentioned bus travel because that's probably the most common um, type of travel that will become most quickly accessible within the community. Um, but we are working with, we have partnerships with other industries. So for example, yesterday we were at Kenworth looking at their facility. They are a um, freight truck, a semi-truck sales company. We're very interested in helping them electrify. Obviously, electrifying bigger vehicles um, will make these impacts faster than just focusing on personal vehicles, which carry fewer people at a time and are I, I know I'm priced out of an electrical vehicle at the at the moment. Um, I told my director that I need an electrical vehicle so that when I go to these communities, I'm practicing what I preach. And he sort of gave me that sideways smile, like, yeah, we'll work on that. So, and, and we are serious about working on it, but we're also very aware of the cost implications right now. With our work, our goal is to make electric vehicle travel more accessible in every way. So, um, we are focused on all kinds of transportation, um, freight vehicles, buses, train travel, um, and of course cars. Also, all the way down, if communities have the interest in electric scooters and e-bikes. 
Um, one reason that we are near um, the west side is one place where we we hope to make an impact is um, with the inland port. And we know that the inland port is kind of a, um, a complicated conversation. We are not the inland port. We are interested in working with them to help them electrify as much of their um, infrastructure and as much of their service as possible. They have um, trucks going in and out. They um, are connected with um, air travel that is coming in and out of Salt Lake City. So we know that if there is a place where we can run a pilot, um, the inland port perhaps gives us a place where we can focus on all the pieces that we want to improve in a contained space. Um, and being that the inland ports um, impacts, I know that some of those conversations are tough on the west side. Uh, we want to help to ameliorate as much of that challenge as we can. So we will be working, I shouldn't say we, the, the engineers within Aspire um, we'll be working, I know, soon to um, try to help electrify some of the freight travel that is coming in and out of the inland port. Um, and I think just a pilot project at a time, we at Aspire just want to see what kind of impact we can make um, in big places that will ripple quickly because you know better than I do that um, time is of the essence when it comes to cleaning up our, our air. So um, if that, I don't want to take too much time. I'm conscious of your agenda, but I am most happy to speak to anyone, answer any questions that I can. If I don't know answers, I will absolutely connect you with the people when, within Aspire who can. Um, if it is of interest to the community, I'm happy to come back and speak in this format. So please do let us know how we can serve you. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you so much. And thank you, Andrew, for your question. And uh, yeah, it looks like I'm next. So I'll just go ahead and share my screen real quick. All right. Is it coming through? OK. Um, great. So I'll, I'll try and keep this short. Um, since next month at our June meeting, uh, I'm planning to present the, the final the final draft of this. This is more of a progress update, more of a 50%, 60% draft to show you guys. Um, but as you know, uh, from maybe previous recordings, um, uh, I've been working on a Friends of Glendale inventory analysis with a, a University of Utah intern uh, who's on this call now, Jake, Jake Link. Um, to essentially take a full inventory of open space and parks as they relate to our Glendale neighborhood. And, and there's Jake now. Um, yeah, thanks for, thanks for making it on, Jake. Um, and just a quick intro to the, the Friends of group. Um, so in early January, um, we were voted to be an official committee of the Neighborhood Council. And uh, that was made an effort to sort of tackle some of um, some of these projects that are listed out here uh, that deal with conservation and maintenance. So anything that you know has to deal with like uh, maintaining and beautifying our, our park system in our neighborhood. Um, also addressing community outreach, uh, kind of understanding the, the park utilization and kind of seeing who the users are uh, in Glendale and, and how they're using the parks. Um, and there really hasn't been a formalized approach to this at the neighborhood level for us. So, so this is a big, uh, a big task that we wanted to tackle um, this year. And uh, finally, another sort of project that we want to we want to get underway is understanding the the cost implications for um, what some improvements may look like um, as they relate to our park system. And this would come in the form of fundraising. But in order to fundraise and uh, go to the city and, and ask for money, we wanted to get a better understanding of what was on the ground for us. So that was that's essentially been our effort um, since early October. And just to give you an idea of, of the work and, and, and who's, who's been a part of this, um, it's been a team of two. Um, so it's been myself, um, 
outside of the council, I'm an active transportation planner. So this is something I'm, I'm pretty passionate about. And if I'm able to bring a little bit of my expertise into this realm, I'm more than happy to do that. Uh, but also a uh, big shout out to, to Jake, who has been just phenomenal throughout this entire process. I think the, the collaboration that has emerged from working with University of Utah um, students has made efforts like these not only possible, but, um, but pretty efficient within the timelines uh, that we're trying to, to work under. So, so thanks again, Jake. Uh, to give a quick graphic snapshot of uh, the work that's gone into this and sort of a quick visual representation of the of the timeline since uh, fall of last year. Um, here's just a quick depiction of how um, our work has been split into tasks tasks throughout the last couple of months. Um, so the initial uh, existing conditions, what we call it, um, analysis that occurred in the last months of last year was a very data oriented um, review of existing plans from the county, from the city, um, as they relate to uh, our park system. So this was our way of understanding what's been done already, what policies have been recommended, what design um, facilities have been recommended that we can, we can learn from uh, and integrate into our plan to not reinvent the wheel. And with that, came a demographic and land use and population analysis, which um, has already, we already have a robust uh, analysis documented from our uh, Glendale One plan, um, which uh, Turner, if you wouldn't mind, maybe you can share a, a link to. And, and the biggest push was taking the existing conditions inventory, which um, in, essentially was Jake going out to every single park, taking pictures, taking inventory of everything from the amount of trash cans to the playgrounds to the benches, and really taking a complete inventory and lining that up against what the city had um, in their data in their data set. So it was a, a very big on the ground effort. And once again, to shout out to Jake, because that's not an easy thing to do by yourself when you're balancing finals and, and uh, jumping into your final semester of study. Um, so, so yeah, that's, that was the effort from November to January. And then moving, just moving forward from February to where we eventually are gonna end up next month um, was the uh, community outreach portion, which uh, entails a online survey and creating a, an online web map to kind of start gathering some of the information uh, that relates to park utilization. Um, so, so Jake, if you wouldn't mind, uh, would you actually share a link to the survey in the chat um, and I'll make sure it gets, gets blasted out, but that's gonna, that survey is gonna be um, online for another week. Uh, but that was, that was our attempt at just understanding how people are using it, um, how are people are using the parks and, and why they're using the parks and maybe, understand perceptions of safety and um, and understand, start poking at some of the, uh, start uh, foreshadowing to some of the potential facility recommendations that could be made based on how people feel about the parks in their neighborhood. Um, and, and finally, uh, here on the graphic task three through four, um, just a little uh, rep representation of where we're gonna be headed here in the next uh, month. Um, I'll, be, I'll be showing some elements of the, of the plan so far uh, to kind of give a precursor to what it's gonna look like, but we are planning on presenting this with the final report at our next month's meeting. So stay tuned, this is just a little taste of what's to come. Um, okay, so th the, the method to uh, getting all of this started was taking that as that initial existing um, inventory of what's on the ground. So we started with uh, visualizing the entire park system in Glendale um, and seeing how the these spaces are designated um, by the county and, and by Salt Lake. Uh, so um, if you just by taking a look, I know when, when I first took a look at this, there was a couple parks, a couple open spaces that I didn't know were, were designated as, as open spaces. There's the big ones, Jordan Park, the 17th South River Park, um, but the, the open spaces along the 
uh, the river were, were really revealing to me in that sense. So um, it's great to have like the full inventory of this with attached acreages and, um, and just seeing what's, what's there. Uh, then my next question uh, sort of that we wanted to, to answer in addition to this was, okay, well, what's there? How are people accessing the park? Uh, that was going to be a big thing that influenced how we tackled the rest of this analysis. Um, so with that came a pedestrian infrastructure analysis. Um, and if, if you look at the map here, um, we have roadways color coded in three colors, uh, a bluish turquoise, a orange and a red. And if you navigate to the legend on the right side, side of the graphic, um, you'll see that the red are roadways without pedestrian infrastructure, meaning without sidewalks on either side of the road. Uh, your orange color depicts a missing sidewalk on one side of the road, and then your, your green network is the complete network, meaning people are able to access the roadways on both sides. Uh, so first glance here, um, we have a relatively complete network in, in Glendale, and, and this is nice. And to contextualize that within park access, there's this very cool tool called ParkServe. Um, and they're led by this conservation group called the Trust for Public Lands. And they, they really take the, the numbers approach to um, understanding how many people within, how many people live within 10 minutes walking distance of a park. Um, so if we take a look here on the left map, uh, that is Salt Lake City's boundary. And anything in that light green uh, shows an area where residents live within 10 minutes walking distance of a park. And then your purple to your light to dark purple gradient shows um, areas for priorities, meaning potential for new parks, or maybe there's some gap uh, in our pedestrian mm, cycling infrastructure. But as that relates to Glendale specifically, um, as you can tell, most of the area is green um, in our neighborhood. So access immediately doesn't become such a big concern. It still is for some populations for some people who may be handicapped, for some people who rely on active modes of transportation. Uh, this doesn't really measure the quality of the infrastructure leading to access. But from our initial survey results, um, it was nice to know that most people who access parks find it relatively easy to get to the parks via walking or biking. So that's just quick, quick there to contextualize uh, what the access looks like. Um, this is just a quick snippet of what we plan to do with uh, the actual uh, individual park assessment. So um, in addition to looking at the park system, we, we have broken down the amenity mix for, for each park that you saw in that initial map. Um, and here we have a, a basically an inventory, a cataloged inventory of uh, all amenities that are broken down into an active or passive slash support uh, category. This is just for us to um, get a better understanding of, of what's really there and if there's anything else to improve, where can we, where can we begin? And it's nice to, to begin with all the data up front. Um, here on the right side, we'll, we'll include a, a graphic for each each park, which will be an, an aerial image of the park with detached acreages and a couple photos relating to the park. So th this is the initial layout we have um, teed up. In addition to that, we, we do have some of the preliminary survey results. It's not coming in as, um, this is just a JPEG and the PDF that we have. It'll be a lot uh, crispier and quality is gonna be a lot better there, I promise. Um, but as, a, as an initial uh, stab at this, at cata cataloging and taking an inventory of what's, what's on the ground um, and what's there, we wanted to get everything compressed into a nice uh, report for, for Glendale residents to have access to. Eventually this is gonna live online, but for now we figured if we have this um, in, a, in a PDF ready to, to share with Glendale residents, it's a good starting point, especially as it relates to understanding the, the cost value associated with some of the uh, facilities and recommended projects we have um, teed up there. Um, and for, for each park, we do have just an area of what it's gonna look like with um, 
all the amenities that uh, Jake documented catalog, and these were the ones that were run against the uh, the existing data set from the city. So um, at a glance, this is what it's going to end up looking like. Um, and the implications for for this, like I mentioned, funding is going to be big. Um, let me have someone there. Um, and just transitioning really quick, there's a Love Your Block initiative where uh, Salt Lake's been selected. Salt Lake's been one of eight cities selected to receive about $100,000 um, worth of funding to uh, launch resident-led uh, projects in the community. Um, so the reason we're, tr we're trying to rush this and kind of push for, for a June uh, finalized date is to um, have all of this documented, number one, but, but to understand what some of those recommended projects may be, uh, because we have money that we can tap into now. And as a pilot project, I know um, people from Rocio and uh, some of the people that uh, are part of that initiative uh, from Love Your Block have been looking at Bend in the River as a potential like pilot uh, open space to kind of understand what, what we can do now. Um, so it's, you know, it's very exciting and um, and hopefully here in the next month, we'll, we'll have everything complete for you guys to, to take a look at. Um, so next steps, um, expect a finalized report next month and um, excited to share. I would also encourage you to, to share the survey with neighbors, um, friends, anyone who lives in Glendale, um, a, a project like this, we have seen patterns emerge from some of like the initial survey results, but having adequate representation from all groups, uh, all all uh, minority groups, people with different income levels, um, people who are linguistically isolated, we and and it is in Spanish too. Um, we we really urge you to to spread the word and um, and thank you in advance. Um, you know we're we're really excited to be doing this and. Um, in the end, it's it's for our community, so uh, we want everyone to to have their say and and hand in this. Um, I'll I'll leave it there. If you guys have any comments, questions, um, let me know, and uh, hopefully I can speak to them. And if not, um, I think next on the agenda are. Uh, City city updates. Okay, I'm I'm just gonna check really quick to see what's coming in the chat. Um, turn over. There's anything coming in from Facebook? Let me know. But if not, I think we are okay to move on. Um, as I understand, Josh Raboyo from the mayor's office is not here, um, and I don't know if there's a representative from the city. And if not, um, we can go to uh, city council updates. Hello. Sorry. I, um, how are you guys doing? Um, I have uh, not that many updates, uh, but there are some big ones. Uh, obviously, uh, Josh would probably would have told you about uh, the budget um, and the budget discussions are happening right now. Uh, I am going to put a link in the chat for everybody to have the information about the proposed budget from the mayor's side. Um, and what the mayor is suggesting uh, or requesting uh, as a budget for this uh, next fiscal year. Um, as you probably heard, she's requesting a, a tax increase, um, if a tax increase for, for the portion of the city. Um, and I, uh, every, uh, every council meeting now, and probably next week, we're going to have two meetings a week uh you know these are public facing meetings so you guys can comment and share your opinion uh where we are asking the departments specific questions about how they're going to accomplish the things that they are telling us that are going to accomplish and why do they need this or that um the on, on tuesday we had the presentation from the police about their increment and the growth that they they, they see and much of the much of the budgeted increase in the police budget is things that the council agreed that we needed to fund and it's uh some of the mental health 
uh, alternate response um, that we requested the police to implement. So they, so they have alternative uh, ways of responding to calls. There is no only over, every time the police officer's job. Some issues are better handled by someone else. Uh, so they are implementing that program so that they need more employees to do that. Um, and uh, so the, all that information is is uh, in, in that link. Uh, we also got a, a report from CAN, which is Community and Neighborhoods, is a very large department. It does a lot that impacts our lives in a daily basis. Uh, and I send them like about 15 questions uh, over that presentation about how they are going to implement traffic mitigation. Uh, that's where that, that, that department lives. I also uh, asked about the, there is a uh, there, there was there is a report done about permitting and how they can actually do better and faster pay, permitting for different projects that are slowing down uh, some of the, the growth that we see uh, and some projects and uh, they are going to re re respond to that. So that is one of the things I wanted to share. Um, I also um, I wrote some notes here. So one second. Um, I also wanted to tell you about redistricting. Uh, the council formally adopted a new map. I'm gonna to try to find the, the map. I had it in front of me uh, for the new district. For the most part, the, 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 the boundaries up north, the boundaries up west, uh, and the boundaries obviously up south have not changed. The only boundary that changed is in part the east boundary from district two. So we're going to 400 west now. In the past, they used to just go into the freeway. Uh, so now we cross the freeway, District 2 crosses the freeway um, um, east. And I'm going to put the link right now. Uh, if you have any questions about that map, let me know. And the map is, is about uh, political subdivision. So it's about the next election, right? Uh, it's, up, it's to make sure that all the districts are equally divided in population. Uh, that's what the census it, they're, they're all a spin off from the information from the census. Um, the state has to do it for the congressional districts. Uh, they also have to do it for the, uh, the House and the local Senate. Uh, the county has to do it too, and the county is adopting theirs very soon for county council districts. And the city uh, just implemented our council districts. So that is also um, one of the links right there. Um, and I also would we'll like to suggest, and I've been talking to Turner and I uh, about the, the big water main uh, issue that we had in, 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 uh, in Glendale uh, that affected a lot of families. Um, and uh, while the damage and all of those things are being worked out and uh, many of the neighbors are going to be submitting uh, claims uh, uh, on the city and whatnot, there is some things that I believe that we could do as a volunteer group uh, is uh, organize some uh, uh, some cleanups for some of those uh, parking strips and front yards. Some of those front yards got dis destroyed. Some um, uh, some of their mailboxes are on the floor. They got uprooted, and if you walk there, it's like a war zone. Um, and uh, between you know all of us, and I I already found a few volunteers. Uh, with shovels, we can also, you know, install their mailboxes again and, you know, at least show them some love from the community. So I would like to see if, if this community council would like to be part of that. Um, I'm um, happy to help with the coordination and try to see what resources uh, I can bring to the table uh, to help some of those neighbors in that very stressful situation. Um, some neighbors actually have been pushed and they're living in hotels uh, because their, their houses got uh very much damage so uh i just wanted to suggest that as a uh, as, as a project hopefully in the next couple of weeks um and that is all the updates i have and if you guys have any questions please let me know great well thank you um we have public safety updates next on the uh on the agenda but i noticed that dan just joined the call so dan we we had you earlier um for for a presentation if if you're ready you can go ahead now and if not i we can, what, we can what, why don't, hey why don't we uh, come come back around to me because uh, i i thought it was tomorrow night i i i never received a link or anything so 
We're good. Okay. Well, in that case, um, public safety updates. Uh, we have up next uh, Salt Lake City Police Department. Um, I don't know if Detective Oliver is on, on the call, but I saw Sergeant. Um, you're going to have to remind me how to, how to pronounce your name, the Sergeant. Is it Tyser Tease? And, uh, and if you can hear me, you're, uh, you, you have to talk. Yeah, I can hear you. It's Ties. Okay, thank you. Does, I'm up. Uh, yeah, yeah, with any okay. updates you, you may have. No, uh, no updates. Uh, the one thing I wanted to express to the group was we're coming into the summertime and traditionally we see a lot more gang activity in the summertime, especially with our shots fired calls. So just encourage uh, the attendees to get the word out to their neighbors. Um, if we hear shots fired or we suspect like there's suspicious activity, we suspect maybe related to gang activity to uh, either get a hold of dispatch or we also have a gang hotline. I can put that in the chat, but it's 801-799-GANGS. And that gets forwarded to the suppression detectives. So then we, when we do our strategic, strategic deployment, we can put detectives in those areas to try to suppress that activity. So that's the biggest takeaway I had for the group tonight. Great, well, thank you. Any, any comments or questions for, for Sergeant? I believe I hear, I usually like to take a moment to thank the police for everything they do for us. I've been here in Glendale for 13 years now, and I have had many interactions with Salt Lake City Police, uh, where they have all been very cordial and very helpful every time. So thank you. Well, we appreciate. Yes, thank you. Um, and moving on. Um, Salt Lake City Fire Department. And uh, Captain Cap Doyle, that's this you. This is Captain Doyle. Yeah, can you hear me okay? We can hear you. All right, thank you. Just bringing a message from the chief, Chief Lieb. Um, this time of year we have runoff and melt off from the snowpacks, even though it hasn't been a tremendous snow year. Employ layers of protection, including barriers to prevent access to water, especially for children, uh, life jackets, and close supervision of children to prevent drowning. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. Is I'm the only, I can't hear you anymore. Either. I Yo. think your sound went down. Uh, did your microphone input change? I think it might have just changed because um, we can hear you slightly, but. now it's no great it was great at the beginning and it sort of dropped um probably three words in or something i'm sorry i can yell <laughs> is that helping at all it, it may yes i think so it may okay maybe it's because i was looking down i'll try to look up is that better yeah that okay. better so i'll just kind of go restart um Based on runoff and spring um, hazards around waterways, streams, and rivers, uh, the chief's message this year or this month is about safety around that water. Uh, the first step, these are provided by the American Red Cross, by the way. The first step is to protect our, our children and our families by putting up barriers around waterways, um, have life jef jackets on them if they're going to be playing near the waterways. We need to just keep them above water so we can get help to them if need be, um, and, and closely supervise our children so that there's uh, no drownings. Ensure that every member of our family learns to swim so they at least achieve skills of water competence, competency, being able to get in the water, get a breath, and stay afloat, change position and swim for a distance to get to the edge um, for safety. And then lastly, know what to do in a water emergency, including how to help someone in trouble, um, calling for emergency and how to do CPR. Um, our teams are ready to do whatever we can to help the community. We are, our swift water team is ready. Um, 
but we'd rather not even have to respond and have no no incidents uh, around the waters. Um, so if you, there's anything the community can do, those are some suggestions. Um, to update you as to the call volume for your uh, for this district, we had in uh, April is the numbers we're do doing right now. We had a combined number between our Quint, which is the engine, and our hazmat, we had 65 calls. And as far as medicals, we had 70 calls for a total of a little over 600 calls this year. So um, are there any questions for me? Doesn't sound like anything in the chat. I don't see anything coming in through the chat. Okay. Well, we're we're thankful that we're here, that we can assist the community and help in any way, and uh, we we appreciate your efforts in staying safe. So, thank you. Yeah. Thanks for your time, Captain. Of course. Uh, uh, Dan, remind me. Uh, do you are you are you ready to present uh, today? Just want to make sure you you get time. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I think I can share, but I don't know. I don't know where the share button is on this. So you'll have to help me out here. All right, let's see. On, on your end, there should be a green arrow pointing up. Um, might be different for me since I'm co-hosting, but is, is that the case for, for anyone who's not a, not a host? And it would be towards the bottom of your screen. Yeah, I don't, I don't see it. Maybe, maybe it's in the more button. I don't know. You have to. Oh, here it is. Share screen. Hang on. There it is. Did it Sweet. come up? That oh. came up. All right. Let me. Sorry. So I'll. I'll because we're towards the end here. I'll. I'll try to expedite here, right? And anybody who's ever seen anything I do knows that this is uh, extremely fast paced. And just hang on and hold on. You know. Anyway, I'm. I'm a teacher, and so that's part of the problem. As Charlotte knows. <laughs> so, so anyway, uh, this is the second time that we've tried to uh, uh, get a, a Salt Lake City a CIP application for the same exact thing. However, the the uh, particulars of the original project were not really uh, perfect, and we were called out on that. The Salt Lake Fishing Game was called out on that, and so we improved that uh, thing, and we made a presentation already to the uh, Poplar Grove Community Council, but. Here's the thing, the Fife Wetland Preserve is, is split right, almost right in half by the two communities. It's really a great opportunity for the two communities to, to do something and, and be together uh, by, by owning that, that, that great little uh, wetland preserve. Anyway, uh, let me see if I can do this. So there, there it is, an aerial view of the thing, uh, kind, of, kind of the way it is right now. Uh, and it was created on this oxbow where the difference between the uh, lower the lower part of your screen, which is upstream, and the bend uh, that goes under that bridge there on uh, on the upper side that that's the difference is only about six inches in elevation in water. So so you don't get a lot of flow with the water coming in the pond uh, on 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 the bottom part and then out on the top part back into the river. But it's been problematic. So we we we've been trying to. To, to, to get that fixed. Uh, originally, it was designed and implemented uh, by solid public utilities who had no clue about wildlife. And, and so they built it more as a pocket park with the kinds of amenities you'd find in a pocket park, you know, with, with hardened surfaces and, and all kinds of stuff. But so the original, <clears throat> the original uh, uh, proposal, here it is, uh, was not really what, what, what we ended up the siding was really needed uh, for this pond and we gave it a lot of thought. And so here's, here's what we came up with uh, for the five specific goals to uh, improve that wetland preserve because it was primarily uh, designed originally for people, not really for wildlife. And so now we can improve it for wildlife so that we can finally get the kinds of wildlife that, that I've been advocating uh, for many years, right? Uh, and, and so it includes removing a lot of stuff. Uh, and creating some manways at the three entrances, that's it, uh, pretty much. Uh, there's a one outlet uh, structure on the, on the pond that needs to be re reinstalled. I, I, I and some volunteers from Salt Lake City 
uh, installed a temporary one that kind of works and it, 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 it's cool. So here's the current manway coming in uh, at the uh, Ninth South Bridge. And you can see that, you know, it's certainly not discouraging bicycle traffic. That's for sure. You can look at all the tracks. And so, so that's, that's the whole purpose of a manway into any kind of a nature area is to discourage that kind of traffic. So that device is dysfunctional. So we came up with this simple, typically used manway, which is just boulders uh, that's three feet wide and, you know, on the inside all the way around. So you can still push a, uh, you know, wheelchair through there or whatever. It still works just fine. Uh, but it's inconvenient for bicycles. So people can get off their bicycle and drag it through, or they just go the other way, which is a lot easier over the other bridge. Right. Uh, and the other thing is that was totally distasteful to our organization, to our wildlife organization, where these great big rock filled gabion baskets that were just totally dysfunctional, scared all of the <laughs> migratory birds away. Uh, and, and, and it was just a bad idea in the first place. So we just want some of these removed. Uh, first thing that kids did was pry them open, grab the rocks and throw them into the pond. And so then it made a, a real hazard with all these wires sticking out. It was just, it was just a really bad liability issue for Salt Lake City. And they, 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 they were so human oriented, you know what I mean? Uh, wildlife flying over migratory neotropical birds flying over this and look down and start laughing, you know? It's just like, what the heck is that contraption, you know? Let's keep going a little farther down where there's a pond, <laughs> where there's a real pond. And so, and then in high water, the whole thing became even more precarious because the kids would try to walk down the top of these these wire baskets that had all these things, oh, nasty, dangerous, uh, you know, fall into the water, could drown. I don't know. It just was a bad situation. Uh, and then the other thing that they uh, added without any uh, approval by either community council, Poplar Grove or Glendale, was this split rail fence because they, they came into a deal where they, they had all this split rail fence that they could install up and down the Jordan River Parkway, but they had enough to do this reach right smack dab down the middle of this nature preserve. Well, it doesn't do anything. It's not a real fence. You can go right through it, but it kills the view. You can kind of tell. It kills the view of wildlife itself. Uh, just walking down the trail. I've done it many times. It, your eyes tend to focus on the closer, brighter things like this railing here, you know. So it was dysfunctional in a lot of ways. Plus, uh, vehicles ran into it. Uh, uh, bicycles run into it. They're just precariously dangerous. The splinters that kids would get kids can't resist climbing that contraption right and so that you know it was just precarious and, and and not look at it here a car ran into this somebody drove in so if we had boulders in a manway then a car wouldn't even be able to drive in over boulders you know that's what we need uh, and then here's the inlet which by the way uh was pretty well designed i i i applaud salt lake city for their design of this inlet it's properly angled and everything uh, and works uh, unfortunately, when the river goes way down, the pond goes way down. And when the river goes way up, the pond goes way up. And the outlet structure was totally misconstructed. So we've, we've, we've tried to remedy it. I see it all plugged up and so the water would fill up and flood things. And it was a problem. See, you look at here, it's flooding the whole area because it plugged up. Uh, then uh, all of these nutrients would accumulate in the pond and cause these algal blooms. I'm sure, <clears throat> I'm sure that some of them were harmful algal blooms uh, on occasion. And that's because there were just fertilizer, too much fertilizer in the pond from years and years and years of water coming in to the pond on one end, dropping all of its load, all its nutrients and silt and everything in the pond, and then going out the other side, clear -er, you know. So here's what it looked like. We redesigned it, uh, threw the rocks out, dug them all out that the kids had thrown in. Uh, so it had a channel. We installed this trash rack to keep everything from plugging up the uh, inlet structure here. And you can see that it worked pretty well. What's really cool, though, is that the carp like this, uh, like eight pounder from the Jordan River could easily swim into the pond through the outlet structure and spawn. Here they are spawning in the pond to create just tens of thousands of baby fish for the migratory birds to eat. And we have about 
What did I think? It's down here later. Anyway, that spawning activity and all that feeding activity of those carp uh, resuspend that silt and it comes out the uh, outlet structure into the Jordan again from whence it came. <laughs> and, and so uh, we're redistributing that pollution back downstream uh, instead of in this uh, wetland pond where it's causing uh, problems, especially for humans. And, and so with all those baby fish, then we could have these cormorants and other birds uh, that will live. We had these for a whole summer. I don't know, Charlotte, if you remember these guys, They're, they were there for a whole summer, but that's because they were fish. But now look at all these birds, 20 native species that we can have just because we have fish in the pond that are reproducing. That is really cool. Everything from grebes to gulls and cormorants to night herons and you name it. This stuff here, this that we see in the fall, is not an algal bloom, it's duckweed that grows on the surface. It's also benefiting from the high nitrogen and phosphorus in the lake, uh, but it turns out it is duck food. That's what they call it, duckweed. So the ducks came in and in two weeks, they, the, they and the geese ate up all of that duckweed on their way south, the migrating south. So that was a great food resource for the birds. I, I, and it was just a, a hoot to watch. A lot of birds came in. And then when the water gets too high, it goes right over the top of the trash rack and, and, and water won't go in or out of the inlet or the outlet, it just sits there because the water is too high as it's been recently. Uh, and then you can see that Salt Lake County has traditionally uh, come in and removed all this silt in this reach below the uh, ninth south culvert that comes out and dumps all that silt from all those streets and everything into the river. Uh, but now I'm not sure what this wetland preserve that they'll be able to gain access. We were proposing to put in a gate. That was number five on that list. Put in a gate and a hardened area so they can at least come in and do something, you know, to remove the silt out of this reef so we don't have flooding or other problems. Uh, and then here's where another of the manways would be. And this is where that gate would be right there at 10th West. And then I just wanted to make a note that uh, we really appreciated uh, recently deceased Ty Harrison, uh, uh, Professor Emeritus from uh, Westminster College for uh, being our, our amazing enthusiast and supporter of the, uh, of the, uh, of the whole Oxbow and, and, and the Fife Preserve. Uh, and then also other volunteers from our group who came in and did a lot of weeding and other work to, and of course, all the people from the neighborhood. You can't even count all the volunteers we've had from the neighborhood who've transplanted trees like all of these. Look at these little uh, pink flags. There's 300 plants or so just recently planted by volunteers, including trees like our state tree, the quaking aspen right here. And this is what we're after. So this is a, a sage thrush. Uh, and 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 it's it, this is a the rare bird that bird watchers would really really like to see. This was in the preserve early on. It stopped in. Okay, not these guys. We're not interested in domestic ducks. They, you know, whatever. Uh, and and the and the domesticated geese can be aggressive. Like they're going to attack this guy. Look at this. This is hilarious. Uh, this is again what we're after. These hooded mergansers in the pond. Look at that. If that isn't gorgeous, I don't know what. And I also want to thank Aaron Benson from Salt Lake City for who's really supported all of our efforts the whole time. And that's, that's all I got. And this is why I started doing all this. It's because of these garter snakes, uh, these wandering Western garter snakes on the, on the river. I, I, I saw them on the river as a kid. I, I grew up on the Jordan and uh, I ran into a kid named JJ. He was standing on the bridge on the night south trestle bridge and he was watching these snakes come out from their hibernation in the in the in the footings there and and, and there was like 50 of them and he was just so mesmerizing so excited and he, all i could see was i was just looking at myself again you know it was really cool to see a new zoologist <laughs> being born anyway that's that's why we do these things anyway questions Um, yeah. Hey, Dan, great presentation. Um, I'm just wondering, um, so when is the CIP, when are, when are these grants, when's, what's the timeline on the grant? Uh, you know, we're, that's an excellent question, Charlie. No, so we're not, we, you know, <laughs> everybody's always said about our organization that, you know, uh, you guys are slower than a, a slug on a cold highway, you know, and, and so we, we just always say, well, in the, in the tortoise and the hare race, uh, we were the, we were the tortoise. 
Wait, wait, wait. The tortoise won the race, though, right? Yes, so, yes. So anyway, I'm just saying that that's kind of our mentality. So we're not on a timeline here at all. We're very patient. Oh. We're just kind of, uh, you know, we presented it to the Poplar Grove Community Council, who gave it a total thumbs up. And so I was looking for the same type of a thing, since this is a joint project proposal through the uh, Salt Lake Fishing Game, as it was earlier. Um, the, the gate for the, on the west side of the wetlands, how is that to discourage biking, bicycles? Uh, that's an excellent question. Uh, yeah, we, what we're proposing in that, in that is a low fence, like three foot fence, you know, the low fence that comes over to a oh. three foot gate. Uh, and so, the, it, 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 you know, you could lift the uh, bike right over it easily, uh, you know, whether people do that or not. I think most bikers are more interested in convenience. You know, and so I'm not too worried about that. But then you'd have the, uh, but then you could discourage that kind of use up to the manway, which would be right at the normal entrance that we see. And would the fence be, if it's a low fence? I mean, isn't it easy to knock down and to, to kind of get destroyed? I I just don't. No. Not. Not, not the way Salt Lake City can make them. That they they just they use a black coated chain link fence that's uh that where the pipe the pipe is like you know it's a two inch top rail and and uh and and you and you make sure to put the pipe pipe right at the top of the fence so that you, it doesn't get mangled and you don't hurt anybody and you you know etc 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 et so it's but, just a very it's very short i think it'd only be what 40 feet 50 feet 40 feet long uh, and then there'd be this gate and then there'd be a manway adjacent to that uh boulder entrance and so that would make it so much more special not not something that people would just blow right through and run over three water snakes. And <laughs> I'm just saying that ain't right. Okay. Uh, one more question. Um, so, oh, you said that the split rail fence, you want that to be removed? Is that what the... Well, it yeah. was never approved. <laughs> we, it should be removed because it was never approved. We, they, we were never we were never approached. Uh, neither was Glendale. I was in both community councils at that time. If we, the community councils were never approached uh, with 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 that particular um, project. That and they have to. That's that's a law that they have to. They that. Oh it, no 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 no. But but it's a it was a horrible. I, relative to wildlife, it was a horrible idea. It's dysfunctional. It doesn't do anything for wildlife. All it does is- Although it does possibly discourage cyclists going through right there down to the water's edge. I mean, it seems like it's a little bit of a, I mean, people can go under, right? And over, but not with bikes. And, but, but one thing that I do, agree with about having that removed is that it's it's the upkeep of it it's not being maintained so yeah. and that was in the presentation charlotte uh the, I, I just glossed over it but but the o and m is just way off the chart and, and if you look at the split pole fence down the parkway oh my gosh so much of it has fallen down now so yeah. it, just, it just doesn't look good for one thing right. okay how many kids have gotten splinters from that fence? Do you have that documented? Oh, no, 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 no. But you, listen, <laughs> okay, that was you, a joke. Okay, you climb on that thing. That was a joke. <laughs> you right. go there. I, okay. mean, I tried to go under and through it many times because I'm doing nature stuff, right? And, and every time I do it, I'm pulling this stuff out of my shirt or whatever. <laughs> All right, sorry. Hey, Dan. Yeah, who is it? This is Stan. Uh, oh, hi. Hi. Uh, I just, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm coming up to speed on this. Where's this wetland located? Oh, I, I'm so sorry. I, got, I moved too quickly. It's, it's, it's nine, nine south, precisely, nine south and the Jordan River. So it's just barely north of the International Peace Garden. And so that's the other thing is that this, this, this is a gem of the entire Salt Lake City because it, it's, the inter it's the intersection between the International Peace Gardens on one side, uh, uh, a community park on the other side. Uh, and as you go up and down the nine line, you, you're running into everything from uh, Fred's 
uh, trees, uh, and, then, and then community gardens, and then whoop de doo bike parks underneath the freeway. Uh, that go, and then the other side going out is going to end up being orchards and all kinds of really cool stuff past the school. And so it's just this beautiful central thing where, where birds can tweet. <laughs> That's it. Well, thank you. Sure. This, you figured out where it is now? You got to go over there. Yeah. I could yeah. show you around over there. It's a hood. There's some cool stuff. I, hey, Charlotte, you know that, 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 that muskrat that lives just barely outside the, uh, the, the uh, outlet structure. It swims over to the outlet structure, swims in, and comes out into the pond every single day. It's been doing that for two years. So it's cool. hilarious. You got to see this. It's oh, <laughs> nature. What do you do with it? Well, thank Sorry, you for, for sharing, Dan. Um, I, I noticed that, Kev, uh, you uh, turned on a camera earlier. I don't know if you wanted to ask a question. Hi, all. Can you hear me? Oh, wait. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I was just going to, I just wanted to see if Dan wanted to make that muskrat our, our mascot. No, 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 no. Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> all right. There are others I have in mind, though. That's a good idea, but yeah. it's cute. It's all cute right. A rat. <laughs> okay. Bye, all. Well, we have reached the end of our agenda. Uh, thanks again, Dan, for, for sharing the great presentation. Um, as, as a reminder to some housekeeping here, the, the council is looking for a, for a treasurer uh, to join. Um, all information can be found on our social media threads and feeds uh, on, on Facebook and, and Nextdoor. So if you know anyone, please share. Um, if you want to do it, we're more than happy to, to have you join the effort here. Um, but as far as community updates go, that's all we have planned for today. So unless there's nothing else, we are uh, okay to end and, um, and end the stream here. Paolo, Charlotte. could I make a, an announcement? Um, go ahead. I'm, I'm a piano teacher at Glendale Middle School. So I used to be the editor of the Westview, but I've, I've retired. And now I'm focusing more on piano teaching. But Glendale Middle School is having a really um, cool performance. It's a piano monster concert. It's where you have 12 pianos on the stage all at once. And we're going to be playing a lot of different um, music from, from different decades. And it's on May 31st. I think it's really cool to see local youth who are achieving really great things. And to even get to know some of the youth in our neighborhood, um, it, it kind of gives you a, a, a better outlook instead of just thinking, oh, you know, some of these kids are vandalizing or making trouble. You see a lot of kids that are achieving great things too. So, um, so May 31st at six o'clock, in, at Glendale Middle School in the auditorium is from six to seven. And afterwards we're having a little tamale, tamale um, dinner. And then the next day is a multicultural assembly. And Glendale has always traditionally had an incredible piano program and an incredible multicultural assemblies. So they're both, that one is also at six. So May 31st and June 1st, 6 p.m. If you want to come over and support Glendale. Great. Well, thank you so much for sharing. And, and thanks, Dennis. I see your comment in there. Would you mind speaking to the comment just to capture it on the recording? Uh, sure, absolutely. Um, just wanted to let everybody know that you can... Um, I'll basically read my post here. You can report any manner of issues um, to Salt Lake City, including graffiti, abandoned shopping carts, concerns regarding homelessness, so much more um, to the city through their online portal or through the smartphone app, SLC Mobile. Um, anyone can download it on their phones. It's in all the phone app stores. Um, just look for SLC Mobile. Um, and also put my contact info in there so that you can contact me with any concerns, questions, comments um, regarding homelessness. 
so that we can um, try and answer your questions and address any issues that you may be concerned about. Um, also, on a side note, I wanted to give my thanks to the community. We at VOA um, went through the planning process and have received approval from the Planning Commission last week um, to expand our detox facility um, and move as well as move our administration into a building at 1875 South Redwood. You may recall we proposed that to this group some time ago at the beginning of this process and have appreciated your support with it. Um, so also, if anyone has any questions there too, then feel free to let me know. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dennis. Um, we are at 826, so we, uh, we can finish this a couple minutes early, uh, but I'll leave this open for any further uh, comments or, or questions. This is your time. Uh, this is Stan Busaith. I would, I would like to uh, ask about potholes. Uh, there's a couple that have been around for quite a while now, and how do we address and get somebody to care for a, or take care of a pothole? And, and I don't have the ad address right now. Somebody actually came to me with this question, and so I'm passing it on. I just happen to know the answer, unless someone else from the city is here, but um, you can report all manner of issues, <laughs> including potholes, um, on the SLC mobile app. So potholes, streetlights are out, um, concerns regarding homelessness, you can pay your utilities bill, um, report graffiti. There are all sorts of things in there that you can do. Um, order a new trash can, whatever you need to do. Um, yeah, absolutely, potholes. And in my experience, they've been very responsive. Um, I've also reported things when street lights got blown over in the big windstorms, or sorry, street signs um, that were blown over or had been run over, um, have had those reported and repaired. Potholes have been filled um, and generally in a timely manner. Um, abandoned shopping carts, which is certainly a big deal. So I would recommend using it for that too. And it's super easy to use the app, takes a picture and stick a pin in it on the map on where the issue is and it will get to the appropriate department. Thank you. you and uh, second question would be, uh, we have some uh, 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 squatters, homeless people who are in the parking lot over at Raging Waters seems to be collecting again. Okay. And we also have some uh, right there uh, across the street where the where the uh, water loops. There's there's homeless camps in there, and we have children that are actually walking to the school from the neighborhood across the that. Uh, it used to be that old trail that you could jogging trail. Um, uh, so they're having to run to walk past this and across that little bridge to get to school in the morning and night. And, uh, and I wonder if there's some way to address that too. Uh, absolutely. Again, reporting it on the app, a concern regarding homelessness. Um, that concern can then go to the city they vet it through um, to the VOA so that their homeless outreach program can try to engage the peoples there and plug them into whatever resources might be available, um, but also puts it on the city's radar so that they can um, determine what resources they have to fight that issue at any given spot or time. Um, and then I'm seeing in the chat that Turner's also saying there's one at the Peace Labyrinth, so. I, I wonder just for those people who maybe aren't uh, app savvy, is there, could you also call one call or something like that um, to report these things? Not that I'm aware of. Um, I'm not familiar with one call and I don't know of a call to report general things. Um, it's either through the app or on the website. There is the website also in the chat that I posted there. Um, yeah, beyond that, I'll tell you what, if it's something more than that, give me, shoot me a call or text and we'll figure something out. And, oh, yeah. sorry, go ahead, Charlotte, sorry. Okay. I was going to echo that, Sarah. I mean, not everybody has apps or what if, what, even language barriers, you know, they, um, I don't think the app is in Spanish, right? Um, it is. Oh, it is. Okay. It is. Good, but if you don't have, if you're not tech savvy, maybe you can find a neighbor who is, and they can report it for you. I don't know. 
Whatever the yeah. problem may be with um, interacting, engaging with the service, let me know so that we can find a, a way through that barrier. Yeah, and I just want to call out to, I haven't always agreed with Dennis Ferris on everything he's proposed, but Dennis, you've been super responsive. And just for others on this call, I have worked with Dennis back in the day when we had the show all along 1700 South and he was super helpful. So yes, give Dennis a call. He's on the ball. He'll take care of it for us. Thank you very much, Levi. I appreciate yep. it. Perfect. And we are at time. Um, thank you everyone for your questions. Thanks Dennis for your expertise and um, yeah, use the app. I've used it before and it's, and it's great. And uh, with that, uh, thank you. And I think we are good to uh, end the recording, Turner. So thank you everyone. Have a great evening and we'll see you at uh, June's meeting. Thanks, Paulo.